I'm Natasha Duarte, the director of the Composting Association of Vermont. I'm joined with Libby Weiland today from Vermont Community Garden Network, and we're going to be talking about shared leadership at community composting sites. What are the qualities of a great leader? When I ask this question, I often hear things like good listener, organized, effective communicator, that they have dy dynamic energy for rallying people into action, they're able to delegate, maybe they're well connected to resources, or maybe they're knowledgeable about, about what's needed to accomplish the work at hand. And especially when you get into the specifics of the project you're working on, that list just goes on and on. But what if rather than relying on one person to hold all of the answers and organize all of the pieces, we took the model of collective or shared leadership? What do we mean when we say shared leadership? Shared leadership can look different in different communities from shared decision making to dividing up tasks and spreading out the responsibility. The essence is that it's not just one person pulling all the weight and calling all the shots. And as a result, your project can benefit from a diversity of ideas, of skills, and of perspectives. These quotes are just great from, from a number of community composting sites and people doing this kind of work. One of my favorites is that shared leadership is like sharing brains. No one has the whole picture. So as a result, groups make better choices, individuals feel more ownership and engage more deeply. And ultimately, shared leadership is really key for establishing sustainable sites. So it allows for deeper engagement into the project and ultimately less burnout from that one single person trying to do all the work. The shared leadership design helps ensure the sustainability of community compost sites like Libby was just talking about. The sites I work with that encounter more struggles are the one where a single champion feels that they need to cheerlead the whole way. Not only can this be tiring after a while, if something comes up for that one person, the continuation of the site can be put in jeopardy. It's true that many community composting sites start with one or maybe a couple people as the driving force, but when these folks actively look for ways to bring in and empower other participants, it's much more likely that someone will be there to step in or step up when needed. Many of the sites I work with also say that the richness of the experience of working with the community towards a shared goal based on shared values is what keeps them engaged. So how do we foster shared leadership? One of the key pieces of this is coming upon shared values and goals to develop shared ownership over the project. And the idea here really is that these goals and values aren't just assumed. You have conversations with your group to articulate them. Some guidance on how you can have these conversations can be found in our mission and vision worksheet, which can be found in our resources. The outcome of these conversations can be as simple as spoken shared understandings, or they can be more involved, going as far as to co-create site goals and a signed agreement. You can see here on this page, the community compost expectations, kind of a template for thinking about this. So what are the, some of the things we want to include, some of those details that might be helpful? Goals are one thing. So the both basic goals, just kind of the, you know, bringing the food scraps out of the waste stream to the, to a higher level, um, kind of more environmental impacts, that kind of thing. Values are good to include. So things like being a good neighbor, holding health and safety at your site. What's expected of you as someone who's participating in the site? So everything from training to if there are work hours that you have to complete might be a part of that. Behaviors are, are something that people might not assume, but it can be good to kind of outline, you know, whether pets are allowed on the site, children being supervised, especially if health and safety is a big concern. And then consequences to follow through on if people are not adhering to those group agreements. And that's something that a lot of groups don't include and either don't think to or are kind of concerned about having to follow up on that kind of thing. But can be really helpful when you run into bigger issues so that um, everyone starts out with the same idea and then understands, okay, if, if I'm not doing this, this is, this is kind of how, it, um, how things work. Whatever you come up with, I encourage you to post it in a common area as a continual reminder. And if your group is willing, again, a signed agreement. So something that people actually, they read it, you read it together, they sign that document. It can go a long way to help you know that you're all starting off on the same page in, in the same place. Additionally, I would also encourage that everyone have access to other information like the project history, kind of some of the background about the, the site, if there are other policies about the site that aren't included in your expectations, just 
everybody just needs to be, be on the same page. That can happen as a part of an orientation. There can be signs on site that help lead to kind of some of that information and or a binder that is in the shed, you know, all different kinds of ways to do that. But there are some great resources out there to help you with that, again, in our resources section. And encouraging you to revisit these goals and values as a group, as new members join at regular meetings, uh, during times of change, when you might be wanting to rethink some of these, what your, what your goals and values are, and when dis big decisions need to be made about your site. Often when groups come together to start community, a community composting site, they already have shared common ideas about why they want to compost, whether it's for organics diversion, making their own compost for their gardens, or whatever other reasons they may have. Talking about these reasons can feel redundant or unnecessary for that initial core group of people, but I still think that it's a good idea to have those conversations. This is where some assumptions can come up that may or may not be accurate even within that core group, so just making sure that you're on the same page. And being able to articulate why you're engaged in community composting is also a really powerful way to bring more people into your site, to entice potential volunteers to get involved, and it gives you good language to use when soliciting donations or looking for funding. It can also be super helpful to fall back, as Libby said, during times of transition. So when some of the founding members are stepping out and new members are coming in, the new folks may have really different ideas about why they're joining and what they think the site is about. So having that site plan or a binder is a great way to onboard new volunteers or, or new leaders in your site and just help that transition. Sites often combine some sort of community time with work days, like turning windrows, screening finished compost, or distributing the finished compost. This might take the form of potlucks or inviting someone to talk about something of interest to the whole group like how to think about incorporating laying hens into your composting site. Creating time and space for connection among your community compost site members is one of the ways that you can actually promote shared leadership. People start to feel that they're really engaged in the community as a whole at your site and they pay more attention to what's happening and feel more involved. Simply creating that space is a way that people then may decide that they want to become more involved and spend more time with the folks at your site and work into either increasing their volunteer time or considering after watching the, the current leadership that maybe they're interested in moving into leadership roles. So similarly, if we're paying attention to the interest energy and needs of uh, the people that we're working with at a site, we are, are able to key into what drives people and keep them engaged at a higher level. Find out what drives people, whether that means surveying them in a more official capacity, just paying attention when you have things like work parties and other you know, meetings and other interaction. Take time maybe as a group even to discuss. These are the things I love to do. These are the things that I'm more tentative about. And these are new areas I'd love to explore. Just getting a sense, maybe even doing some asset mapping around what are, what are the skills of our group and how can we best accentuate that. And then, and then matching those skills, those people with the roles that will keep them connected in, in interested in, in the work that you all are trying to accomplish. So get creative with involving people. For example, someone who loves the cause, is really into composting uh, at your site, but doesn't actually want to get dirty. That, that could be the case. That person could be a great outreach person. They might be your connector to the wider community. And, and that's equally important when you're kind of looking at the bigger picture of how you accomplish things in your shared leadership design. I want to mention too that the actual direct invite or ask can go a really long way. So not just asking the group, you know, when you have something that needs to be done. So who wants to do this? And kind of that broad ask, like kind of just waiting for people to respond, but actually going to someone and saying, hey, I've noticed that you're really good at rallying people, at getting people organized. Uh, we need someone to organize this work party. Can you do that for us? Those direct asks go a long way to helping people feel wanted, uh, recognized for the skills they have to offer, and oftentimes more likely, on the spot, <laughs> more likely <laughs> to say yes. So the last thing I'll mention about this is just also being responsive. So responding to requests and needs that people have so that people feel heard and valued. Again, that goes back to sort of the ownership and buy-in and engagement that people are gonna feel as a part of your project. 
Um, and then I also want to mention that our volunteer video that we have that talks about what do your volunteers want well, go, goes into a lot more detail on this particular kind of engagement aspect of including people in your project. It's really important that everyone feels that they have something to contribute that's valued and that there's space for them to do so. That may be something more, you know, some sites are certainly more formal and have set hours or activities or committees and others are a little bit more ad hoc. But thinking about what committees or crews will meet the needs of your site and how to engage people in that. And so it could be on outreach and education, like Libby was saying, not everybody is necessarily as gung-ho as, as others for doing the turning and moving compost or organics materials around, but there's still this great outreach component that is of service to your site. It could also be that you, depending on where your site is located, you have rat patrol or woodchuck patrol and you need to have people holding the responsibility of weed whacking around the site so there are fewer places for animals to hide. And we're not really getting into the specific activities for these different committees in this video, but more just giving the idea that what this really ends up looking like on the ground is having committees that focus on different areas and all of this together is what helps your site run smoothly. The compost stewards or compost managers, of course, play a key role in understanding the, the bigger picture and all of the different tasks, but then having these sort of satellite groups make sure that all of the functions are performed is really helpful for a site success. By rotating the different people who are involved either at that higher level coordinating level or in different committees or having some redundancy or overlap is another way to prevent burnout and keep things really interesting for the people who are involved. Some people may be really comfortable doing certain tasks, but talk to them and find out. They may have been doing something that they felt comfortable in, but after being a part of the site for a while, they may start feeling ready to be invited to do other things. So having that iterative or continual sort of checking in and conversation strengthens the sense of community and relationship among members of your site. It also provides opportunities to have those conversations of, hey, you know, I've never been involved in this particular committee. Maybe I can, you know, there's a way for me to step into that role. So we've talked a lot about different aspects of shared leadership. There are a lot of resources available to help you think about what this will look like at your specific site. You can find them at the Composting Association of Vermont in our community composting section. Vermont Community Garden Network has this great garden organizer toolkit. And even though it's focused on gardens, it's definitely a lot of the principles are great for community composting sites and really any kind of community group activity. And then the Northeast Recycling Council has a whole number of resources. If you need help finding any of these resources or would just like to talk to one of us for more information about the content we shared in this video, please feel free to reach out to myself, Natasha, Libby, or Lynn. Happy composting.